Welcome to Perspectives with Asama Silva. Um, today we're going to talk about a recent incident that happened in New York. As most of you know, that was in national news. A terror attack with a man uh, driving his truck into pedestrians, uh, killing about eight people. Um, we've heard a lot about this particular story, and I don't think we need to go over too many of these details. But today we have um, a, a, a woman, um, Afaf Nasher, who is the Executive Director of Council of American Islamic Relations of the New York chapter joining us today. Um, thank you, um, Afaf, for joining us and uh, talking about this, this very, very um, controversial, in my opinion, issue only because of the way it was reported. But before we get into that particular conversation, would you please set the stage for what it is that we are talking about and what incident it is with the details of what this man did? Sure, absolutely. So, of course, you know, here in New York, it was pretty chaotic for a bit. What we heard was that an individual using a rental truck had rammed into others in lower Manhattan. Eventually, what we found out is that eight were killed and 11 were injured. Um, the individual identified through his through his words at, during the attack that he was Muslim. And so word started coming about that this was possibly a terrorist attack as soon as they linked the fact that um, that he had said the words Allahu Akbar. And of course, the investigation went on from there. And it was this great mourning and sorrowfulness within the New York community and of course around the world, but certainly within the New York community to learn that there had been an attack on our streets and that people were going to be mourning the deaths of loved ones that they had just seen possibly a few hours before. What is the reaction of the Muslim community, especially in New York, where this incident happened? I mean, you know, I get that question a lot, but, you know, Asma, I'll be very frank and honest, and I, I hope, you know, you don't mind my directness, but I don't understand that question so much because people seem to think that our reaction as within the Muslim community would be different than the reaction of any other community. And that is really, of course, horror and mourning and sadness. And the reason for that, of course, is that the obvious reason, people are dead. And it's very difficult to wrap your head around that as a human being, as a person of faith, as a person of conscience. And that has something, you know, that's something that goes beyond any one community. But of course, it resonates with the Muslim community because we understand that even one innocent life lost is as if the entire humanity has been lost with it. And so, it, of course, any person of faith would understand that and understand that concept. And so the reaction within the Muslim community is really one of sorrowfulness and, and really trying to grapple around what we can do to make this world better, not just for the Muslim community, but for our neighbors, for the New York community, for the state, and for the entire nation and world globally. Now, up till now, I have not read, but have we found out more of what the motivation was for this particular man, uh, what his reasoning was to do this kind of attack? I'm sorry, I can barely hear you. I heard that um, you were possibly asking for more details about the perpetrator, was that yes. right? Yes, his motivation. Do we know anything about his motivation? Yes, so we don't know. My understanding is that there was some sort of letter in Arabic written that they found um, that, he, that he identifies himself again as being Muslim, that um, I don't know whether or not there was some sort of clear cut connection to ISIS. From what I read it after the attack and then hours and now days after, there was no claim by ISIS claiming any kind of responsibility on his behalf. So I don't know whether or not that connection has been made clear or not. Now, anything to do with the Uzbek part of it, the fact that he's from another country, um, is there any concern that maybe this is also an indication of not just Muslim, but for immigrants too? Absolutely not, especially in New York. I think we understand that, uh, especially in New York, because we are a city of immigrants. Um, New York is mainly made up of immigrants, and we contribute towards the economy of the city and really, of course, looking on a broader level to the economy of the entire nation. And besides the economy, we bring culture, we bring um, a wealth of knowledge and, and, and services and skills. Um, and so the truth is, is that America cannot survive without its immigrant population. 
population and that it's and that the immigrant population is integral in who and what America is. And now I'm talking beyond just the economics or the metrics, but I'm also talking about even the very principles of America's as you know, that the first people who came to America were fleeing persecution. And that is mainly what Americans do, along with the fact that they're looking for better opportunities within this great land of ours. And so the idea of linking a person's immigration status with a, a particular act of one human being is ridiculous and unfounded and unfair and unjust and un-American for that, for that matter. Well, the reason why I was asking you that question, because CARE Massachusetts sent out a statement um, the same week, uh, I think the same day, or the, actually the other day, the next day after this incident, um, about several FBI raids of homes of Uzbek American in different states were conducted. Uh, are you aware of that? And can you tell us a little bit more about that? Why were, they, were, the, were there raids at these certain Uzbek American homes? It's not surprising at all that there were raids. The truth is, is that law enforcement agencies have really focused and even targeted the Muslim American community, and that came long before this attack. Um, and we see it here in New York all the time. I'll give you a quick fact. The Office of the Inspector General here, which is basically the office which audits the NYPD, they audited uh, some of the intelligence department's investigations and found that 95% of their resources are focused on the Muslim American population in New York City alone. We also know that surveillance has really been prevalent in schools, in mosques or masajid, places of worship, in neighborhoods. There was a demographics unit which really became sort of infamous in New York. And so all of the surveillance is nothing new to the Muslim American community. And another fact is that CARE alone received over 100 calls of FBI visits to people's homes the weekend before the election as well. So it's unfortunately, it's not something surprising. This is not the first time that we hear of law enforcement targeting the Muslim American community because of their Islamic faith. It's profiling, really, at its base. And it's wrong. It's illegal, is our opinion. And of course, like I said, um, it's cont it, unfortunately, it's continuous. So that begs the question. You, you mentioned that these kind of raids and investigations have been done in the past targeting the Muslim community. Uh, be it after a national violent attack uh, or after or before elections, how does the Muslim community and specifically care uh, want to move forward? Uh, this sounds like a policy issue. It sounds like a social issue. It sounds like um, an issue you mentioned the police departments. Uh, what 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 do we as American citizens, Muslim or non-Muslim, uh, should be aware of, and what can we do? Well, first and foremost, everyone has to be educated on their rights, which is something that CARE is very proactively doing within the Muslim community and within all communities who request a workshop. And so essentially, we go over people's constitutional rights and let them understand what are their rights if they're stopped by law enforcement, if they're visited by law enforcement. And that's whether you're talking about ICE agents or the FBI or the NYPD or maybe Customs and Border, which is another area in which Muslims have really been targeted and profiled coming in for no other reason, again, because of their faith. So knowing your rights is the first thing. Second thing is understanding other programs, like, for example, countering violent extremism programs on the federal level level and also on the local level and even worldwide level. And those programs tend to create this huge cloud of suspicion and focus on Muslims, again, not because of anyone's particular act, but because of this inherent idea that if you're Muslim, you are perhaps prone to committing some sort of wrong act, which of course is racist, it's false, and it's absolutely unconstitutional. So making yourself aware of programs and stats like the one that I talked about a moment ago with the NYPD's intelligence department is very important as well. And then third, of course, is proactively engaging um, in, for example, voting in this election that's coming up, right? So when we talk about the NYPD, well, what can the mayor do for the Muslim community with regards to surveillance issues? We have a mayoral election here in New York City in just a few days. So becoming civically engaged, becoming people who are, um, who are among the first and the largest group of people who vote, who perhaps go into politics themselves, is also another very important step that we are starting to see Muslim Americans jump into. 
Now, I have heard comments um, from Muslims and some non-Muslims uh, asking me, would you have seen this particular incident or any incident that might, might have been uh, conducted by someone who possibly was uh, you know, assumed to be Muslim uh, in a different way? So we just came out of the Las Vegas shooting. Um, as a nation, we're still grieving. And that was covered in one way. Um, of course, it was a white shooter. The religion was never mentioned. Um, but, and, and people said that he could have had a mental illness. That was one of the motives that was mentioned. Um, how do you think that it would have been reported differently if this New York attacker was not Uzbek or was not Muslim? Well, it's very, very, very clear. And I think to you as well, to me, as to anyone who is at least a bit logical or reasonable, that there is a very clear double standard. And we see this time and time again. If you are to look up the 10 or the 20 largest mass murders in the United States, you'll see that you know the overwhelming majority of them were not committed by anyone because of a particular faith. Yet every single time there is even the slightest bit, even the potential connection for the perpetrator to be Muslim, it's always identified as terrorism. And you know, and we see this in in other in other ways as well. You know, you know. I saw when I went into my kid's school one day a poster that one of the school clubs had post had put up, and it said, "Whenever a Muslim commits an attack, they're terrorist. Whenever a black person commits a crime, they're a thug. Whenever a Latino person commits a crime, then somehow they're gang related, or you know, to use even worse language, a rapist, as the as our president had unfortunately mentioned and." and and unfortunately, really, it's just shameful. But the point is, is that what we tend to do is that we view either people by their the color of their skin or if they're Muslim by their faith, and then we like to link them with these derogatory, either derogatory terms or in this case, terms that really have a lot of legal meaning as well, because the term terrorist is going to apply to the way that they prosecute the individual. But when it's a white person, whether or not they're identified to be a supremacist or not, we just view it in a completely different category and we look for every other way to explain it and we don't apply the same application. And that's very, very clear to anyone who just takes a quick look at some of the worst mass, mass murders in the United States. I think what you just said really uh, shines a light on the necessity of mental health and support that we need in this country, uh, which, which I think is a national problem. Um, it, 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 you know, over, it overarches all religions, race, cultures, ethnicities, gender. Um, but what I was, wanted to ask was, we had CARE New York um, join in. Before this show turned into a TV show, it was a radio show. And last year, there was an incident in New York, in Queens, where there were two imams that were murdered in Queens. Now, that, that was one of uh, a very sad day. Uh, they had just come out of prayer and worship from the mosque, um, and they were murdered on the street. Uh, but from that point, did the Muslim community do any sort sorts of actions of preparation for backlash um, that they are implementing now, especially after this terror attack? Yes, absolutely. And so we are still intimately involved with that case. Care New York in particular is working with the families to make sure that their voices are not lost or forgotten throughout the prosecution of the matter. We're actually awaiting trial. We're hoping it'll begin this month, if not in the month thereafter. And because there was such community activism surrounding this horrible, horrible crime, um, the mayor had publicly stated that the full force of the law would really, you know, would would apply here. And what we saw is that the district attorney of Queens also made sure that they prosecute, that they will charge, or they have rather charged the perpetrator with the highest, with the highest degree of murder possible. And so we do see that result in that particular case, because there was such a huge, like you said, this huge cry, this huge, you know, um, reaction from the Muslim community saying, how could this happen? And if you recall, that was not the only incident that summer. And even, you know, for a few months, there was this span of time that it was just one crime after another, one hate um, or biased incident after another. 
And I think that was just sort of, you know, the last rope for people where they were sort of mourning their religious leader who in broad daylight was killed for what reason? Um, and so it was really sort of a horrifying murder to have witnessed and the community came out and I think some results were received. Of course, justice won't be determined and served until we find out what happens uh, through the end of the prosecution of the perpetrator. Well, it's very good to hear that the community has taken that incident very seriously and that person who committed that crime is being prosecuted and that is in progress. Uh, I want to circle back to something you mentioned about when I had asked if this wasn't a Muslim, how would this have been reported? Now, I, just yesterday was another incident in Tampa, Florida, but this was a positive story. Um, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but there was a young uh, a man, 48 years old, who um, actually was uh, proclaimed a hero in their local news uh, because there was a, again, with this incident in New York, it was um, a, a, rental car, a rental truck from Home Depot that was used. But ironically, in Tampa, Florida, just yesterday, there was a man who drove a truck into Home Depot. And the man who um, rescued and caught the, the, the perpetrator was a Muslim man. Um, and I was listening to his words. Um, his name is Radwan Lut, uh, Lut, Lutvik, I believe. And he was saying that the reason why he uh, jumped out, he ran towards a screaming that he did not, he was not aware of, he was shopping. He was just a regular shopper that day, happened to be Muslim, decided when he heard all these screams that he, it, that was unusual in Home Depot, he dropped all his merchandise and ran to help. Um, he saw this man in a truck run into the store, jump out of the truck and try to run away from the scene. Now his heart in that incident went, if I don't do something now, another Muslim will be blamed because this is going to go national and they're going to think this is another Muslim with a truck. So what he did was it motivated him to run after this perpetrator uh, because he was a nurse and had been trained in how to subdue and catch, and, uh, catch people with mental illness because he's a nurse. He was able to catch up with this man and be able to you know, hold him until the police came. But surprisingly, this news never went national. Surprisingly, in the local news, this particular incident was proclaimed as a dad who is a local hero. Never once did they mention he's Muslim. Never once did they mention that his motivation to actually go and hold, you know, catch the perpetrator was because of his faith. Um, he also said the reason why he did this uh, when he was running towards the perpetrator, he had his phone on so that it would be a witness that he wasn't doing any harm to this person. Like, that really shows me the kind of fear that Muslims have in this country, that even though they want to do something good, that they want to also then make sure that they have proof and witnesses that they did mean no harm. Um, what would you say about this incident, especially compared to the incident that was just covered in New York? I'm not sure if you were familiar with the Tampa incident, but from what I have described, does that explain all the, you know, misconceptions, discrimination, and how we portray Muslims? I mean, uh, what would your opinion and what, what is your take on this? I would say that's a definitely a very good example because here we are, you know, it's, it's beautiful in one sense and sad in another sense, right? Where you have a human being who wants to do good but has to worry about, you know, the, what, the, what the possible... Um, details of what might come out be to the point where he has to stop running and put on his phone to make sure he has a witness. I won't say that it's surprising, though, um, because, again, just relating to the information here in New York, really the surveillance issue has come to the point where even imams, which are, of course, clergymen at mosques, cannot give a sermon without, um, without videotaping themselves because they're afraid it might be taken out of context. And that is the very unfortunate reality we are living in as Muslim Americans. And I always tend to remember the younger generation, Asma, because remember, we have a whole generation of young folk who grew up after 9-11 and have known nothing but the suspicion um, simply because of their name or their faith or their identifying themselves with Islam in some way. And so them always having to somehow validate themselves, whether it's subconsciously or very conscientiously, is a pretty sad reality. I'm glad that the individual in Florida did what he did. 
Um, it's wonderful. I'm not surprised that the story was not, um, they didn't make any headlines, not surprised at all. Muslims do wonderful things every single day. You don't hear about it, um, but that's typical. The media don't want to sensationalize something, and this is the way to sell papers and to grab attention, and it feeds into the rhetoric. It gives our president something to say, which then further feeds into, into the sensationalism, and you know, it just goes on from there. Oh, what you were just saying about, the, think about the youth. Um, as you were talking about that, it reminds me of African-American mothers talking about how they have to train and educate their sons. Um, about how they can't simply just say, um, you know, trust the police officer that stops you when you're driving in the car. Uh, they have to instruct them on how to behave, uh, saying, yes, sir, please, make sure you don't do, you know, uh, jerky movements or um, movements that are, are not, you know, normal in the sense of what a police officer would expect. Uh, this is somewhat like reminding me of what you just said. Think about the youth. And the fact that they are becoming very, you know, conscientious of their religion and even their slight actions. Now, are you seeing that in terms of youth, um, in terms of CARE New York? I know you work with youth and you, um, as an organization, represent cases when these come up. What, what are the, some of the cases that you can maybe share with us that do affect youth in this sense with this kind of perception that's going on? Sure. I mean, I'll tell you myself. It's not that I've seen it. I implement it myself. Right? I sit down at the dinner table and I have discussions with my family members and with my children on how to behave if they're approached by law enforcement. This is not something that's just you know very rare or happens occasionally. Not anymore, not in the Muslim community. And so you absolutely have to take that time and do exactly what you were talking about, just like our African-American brothers and sisters do because of the color of their skin, they have to train their young men on how to deal with law enforcement. The Muslim community, male and female, has had to do the same. And of course, that spans across all the different um, colors and diversity and races of the Muslim community and ethnicities, you know, because we are a very diverse group. And so it's complicated in, in that sense. But having said that, those discussions are happening at my very own dinner table with my family, with the younger generations, as well as the older generation. Um, and as far as cases are concerned, yes, we, we do see that all the time. And it's, you know, I'll, I'll give you a, a little bit of, of a taste. Um, I, we have clients who travel and cross the border, let's say from Canada to New York. And they say, when I came, when I used to cross the border from Canada to New York a few years ago or before 9-11, I used to be greeted and told, welcome home. Now I'm that same person who has contributed to this country for more than 30 years, who has been a citizen for more than 30 years, who is a professional, who pays their taxes, who's civically engaged. And instead, I get pulled aside for two to three hours. I miss my flight. My wife is sitting there crying, and she doesn't want to travel with me anymore. And my children can't hold their head up high because every other car that passes that doesn't have a Muslim passenger, that's not brown-skinned, you know, they're looking at us and they're trying to decide what we've done wrong. And that that has to play into the psyche of every Muslim American to some extent. You know, and it's it can be devastating. It can be devastating to the younger children and to those who have been such great Americans and have done nothing but good to this country and expected nothing from good in return. And to have to deal with that day in and day out on every level, whether we're talking about, you know, at the airport or on the streets or even in schools. It's, again, a very unfortunate reality that we see every single day with our clients and with those that we speak with within the community. I'm going to circle back to how we originally started this conversation. Um, and I started off by introducing this as a conversation about New York and its uh, you know, incident of terror. Um, but legally speaking, someone said to me, be careful on what you call a terrorist attack because there's, I guess, filters and there's, there's actually requirements or criteria that can be considered of what is a terrorist attack and what isn't. But unfortunately, the second we hear the word Muslim, we associate the word terror or terrorist attack. Could you please just give us a little bit of an indication? What is it that really constitutes as being called a terrorist attack? You know, I mean, I suppose it depends on how, who you ask. A lot of times a terror attack for some will mean essentially that it's connected to some sort of foreign entity, 
right? And so, for example, if it's connected to um, ISIS abroad, then automatically it'll be deemed a terror attack. Uh, but what, whether or not that connection is made clear in this particular matter, because I know you wanted to get back into the New York matter, that hasn't been made clear at this point. But regardless of whether or not it meets that particular criteria, the truth is, is that we were calling it a terror attack. And by we, I'm saying the media and the general public was calling it a terror attack before any such connection was even, you know, mentioned in the, in the remotest way. And so in in reality, what's happening is that it's being called a terrorist attack whenever it's a Muslim, period. There's just no way around it. We haven't seen that in any other instance um, in, in all these examples that we've cited throughout this talk. The reason why I'm asking is the Las Vegas incident was, uh, you know, coined mass murder. So I'm honestly, as a lay person, very confused. When is it a mass murder? When is it a terrorist attack? When it is a terrorist attack? Uh, or an attack of terror. We have all these phrases that are describing similar incidents, but I'm unaware of when to use which phrase and what does each phrase and nuance and consequences of each phrase are. Yes, I definitely agree with you. And, for, and in general, what we would call a terrorist attack is when it has external political connections or ramifications, um, mass murder. I mean, obviously, um, it, this was a mass murder as well. Mass murder will kick in any time more than one or two people are killed. Um, so that's, it also qualifies as a mass murder. And a large part of that also has to deal with whether or not the federal government picks up on this crime and decides to prosecute on a federal level versus the state level. Well, thank you so much. I think we are uh, almost out of time, but thank you so much Afaf, for joining us today. And I hope that we have another conversation on a happier note. Uh, not such on a serious note. I um, do as well, and there are plenty of happy notes within the Muslim community and outside of good people doing good things, and, and I look forward to that day when we can focus on those stories. Thank you, Asma. You're welcome. Uh, just to finish up with my perspective on this show, um, I felt that I had to talk about this show because just a couple weeks ago we talked about gun violence and what had happened in Las Vegas and how it affects the community psychologically and the community as a whole. Um, the reason why I wanted to do this show, particularly on New York, is of course all of us nationwide have heard of this incident, but we do not hear of the, in, the, the perspective of the Muslims, the community that it affects when the media reports with such um, violent and negative words and, and, and people end up in their minds painting a whole community with a broad paintbrush. Uh, and that's the reason for this particular show, is to really show all sides of a story. And I hope that you understand that two incidents happened very similar in the same week. A truck truck driver killing eight people in New York, Muslim, but called a terror attack. Another truck driver driving into a Home Depot in Florida, but no one has heard it nationally. And I leave it to you to make your decision of what, what, what is terror? Is it when it's Muslim or if it's just any attack that really hurts human beings? Thank you for joining us, and I hope you join us again next week when we cover another topic to show different perspectives.